Hello, and welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and I'm so happy you're joining us for this interview. On this episode, I had Ani Hawkalter and Garrett Hudson, the horn and flute player from Winsync, a dynamic woodwind quintet out of Houston, Texas. It was great to talk to them on the eve of their chamber music festival they created called On Stage, Off Stage. We talked all about what goes into starting a chamber music festival, as well as what it is like to run a chamber group for your career and some key components to making it work. This episode is a peek inside of what life can be like as a professional classical musician who chose work outside of the traditional job path. This was a really fun talk with these two energetic and fun people. I really enjoyed hearing how they bring such creativity to their careers. But before we get started, I want to thank Fix Music for providing the hosting for the show. When you're looking for high quality sheet music at affordable prices, look no further than fixmusic.com. And get this, they are making so many improvements to their site. Starting now, they have lots of music for all the strings, as well as continuing to add music for winds and brass. They've improved their checkout to use real-time quotes for priority two to three days and priority express overnight shipments. And unlike many of their competitors, they do not pad these methods to make more money. If you need it fast, they will get it to you as cheaply as possible. They also have some new fantastic options for making music buying easy for students through teachers and schools. Haven't we all had that problem where you ask students to get something for their lessons and they come back and say they couldn't find it, or the music store didn't have it, or any other number of other excuses? Let Fix Music help you take care of this problem. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. And for Crushing Classical listeners, just for you, use the discount code CRUSH and get 10% off your order now. Check them out at fixmusic.com. Thank you for joining me today on this episode with Ani and Garrett from WinSync. Let's get started. Hey guys. Hey, Ani. Hey, Garrett. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having us. Doing well. Great. Awesome. So you two are the horn player and Garrett, you're the clarinet player, right? False. I'm the flute player. False. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he, he moonlights oh my on Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> You're the flute player. Awesome. So you guys make up two fifths of wind sync. And will you tell me, one of you, tell me a little bit more, or both of you, about um, what you do with your group? Yeah. Um, Garrett, I'll get started. So um, cool. this is. So this is Ani. I'm the horn player. Um, Wind Sync is a chamber ensemble, but it's really a vehicle for um, our artistic expression. Kind of as like individuals, we try and make sure that um, everything we do and everything we perform and all of our programming really speaks to the five of us and kind of where we've come from and um, and our kind of artistic backgrounds. And that vehicle is then shared with. Um, children, families, community members, audiences of all ages, all over the country, all over the world. Um, and so it really becomes uh, quite a, a beautiful experience for us and hopefully for audiences. Um, and, and yeah, so it, it's a learning vehicle. It's a, it's a vehicle for inspiration. It's, um, it's a chamber ensemble. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What do you, tell me what your, um, your side of the story is Garrett like that that was a beautiful uh description but what do you tell me what you think too can I just say what she said because that yeah. was pretty good yeah <laughs> what I, she said I was, I was channeling you Gare yeah no that was that was great um yeah it, it actually is just like a, a beautiful outlet for us as um as people I mean everything that Ani said in terms of reaching into the communities and um and having quite a substantial impact we think on the classical music world um but just for ourselves as people and being able to open up and experience these like this kind of beautifully emotional path with each other and um, this creative output. Uh, it's just like, um, it's just quite special to experience. That sounds so great. Um, so do you play traditional repertoire or do you do you commission works or do you do a little bit of both? What do you do for repertoire? 
Well, actually, we we do both of those things, yes, but primarily um, members of WinSync uh, will kind of decide on pieces that exist in this world that that really inspire us or that um, that we think would work really well with this group, and and that means drawing upon other literature, so orchestral and um, you know string quartets, things like that, and so we actually primarily present. Uh, concert programs that are our own arrangements as an ensemble. And yes, uh, we do uh, some commissioning work as well with composers that we're, um, we're really interested in the work that they're putting out. Um, and occasionally, traditional repertoire for Wind Quintet is included in our programming as well. Yeah, um, that's great. I just wanted to add the our um, the reason we, we it, it kind of has fallen that way is because um, programming to us became uh, this really, really creative, um, really important aspect of what we do. We, we saw a concert as an opportunity to really share like a theme or a story in a lot of um, really juxtaposed abstract ways. Um, we really liked the idea of picking a theme and just kind of hitting it from all kinds of different angles and drawing upon um, our experiences. Because uh, the five of us have consistently had a wealth of experiences in just a million different kinds of performing arts. And so uh, so this idea of taking a theme and really um, creating a through line is something that we've, um, really, adhe- we, we've really adhered to it for, for the duration of WinSync. And so, um, so that's why our programming um, as of right now, is not really a bulk of traditional repertoire because we wanted there to be no boundaries to that programming. Right. So give me, can you give me an example of, of the themes that you're talking about? Is it a theme in, within a concert or tell me more about the um, theme that you were just talking about? Yeah. Like, so like just this, this one's pretty um, easy to kind of wrap your head around this for the past couple of seasons, we've um, toured with a programming that um, where the, the major theme was Shakespearean literature and music inspired by that. So, um, so that went as literal as um, we are. Our, our very talented um, former clarinet player did a wonderful arrangement of Mendelssohn's Scherzo from *Midsummer Night's Dream*. So that was like how we opened the program, and that's a very literal representation. Uh-huh. Um, and then it went as abstract as. Um, we did four movements from um, the Pulcinella Suite, and that was related because um, Pulcinella is this um, very classic Commedia dell'arte um, character, and uh, and so within Italian um, storytelling and Italian opera and music traditions, um, we this he's this prankster, and and he also seemed to us to be very Shakespearean in nature. Um, in kind of this like very comedic, um, comical way, and so, so we just kind of we just kind of took the theme and really ran with it. And uh, also, and so- uh, can I jump in, Ani? The the way that we also um, choose to present uh, these pieces that we've arranged also doesn't have to necessarily represent the traditional way of of showcasing a piece. So, for instance, in this. Um, Shakespeare-inspired theme. Um, we did an arrangement of both Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet ballet suite, as well as Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story, the modern take on oh. Romeo and Juliet. But what we did is we kind of intertwined the movements from both of those works to tell a through story of of Romeo and Juliet. So there's a lot of um, flexibility and creative license i would say with how we're um how we're creating these programs i love how creative you guys are getting with it that's so inspiring i just that's amazing so you know i have to ask this question right now because I, right now i'm thinking about you know you guys don't sound like you're missing the symphony world at all having a job <laughs> <laughs> and so i wanted to know have you been on the have you considered, you know, maybe before WinSync, did you guys consider going on the audition path? Did you ever consider that? Or was that your original intention? Because most of the time, you know, for music majors, it is. So I just wanted to know if that was for either of you. It, it certainly was. I think I think for most members that have ever come through WinSync, that 
uh, that was certainly um, certainly the goal. And it was definitely mine when the group was first getting started because the group formed at Rice University um, mm-hmm. while I was a master student there. And um, and yes, you kind of you kind of think when you're going to school and you're that young that your job as a classical uh, instrumentalist is probably to just get into an orchestra. But joining this group and as this group evolved, um, I guess we we quickly developed this additional interest in having uh, so much control over over our careers and what we were doing and where we were going and who we were presenting concerts to. Um, and and the mindset just totally shifted. Right. Yeah, I my I think like this is probably just me personally um, is a little bit different. I was also like like Garrett and like all the other musicians in Winsync. Um, I went through the university system and when we went through our university or various conservatories in, you know, the early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, that was the like that was the end goal. That's what was kind of funneled to you as the you know, the, like where, where your training was leading up to. Um, and in my mind, I thought it was a worthy goal because I saw orchestras as kind of the peak of skill and, um, and just kind of artistry because I loved and respected them so much. And I, so I thought, okay, well, this is like a really great like benchmark. Um, but there was always something in my mind that I knew I probably wasn't going to ever pursue that route. (laughs) Um, And I think that's just kind of because I, I just kind of, kind of talked to myself a lot about what I was doing when I was in music school. And, and that's just like something that maybe is just like uh, a sign of me and my own neuroses or something. But, um, (laughs) but anyway, I, I, I kind of always knew that I, likely was not going to do that and so um so i still kept that as like the end goal because i believed in the uh i mean i believed in the artistry that one needed to have to win that job and so so it seemed like a a worthy um thing to uphold but uh but i ever since i remember ever since i graduated when people would ask me what i wanted to do i would say like well, I would I would love to play in an orchestra. I love playing in horn sections, um, and I love the the music and all that stuff. But um, but I would always say, but I would be really interested in like any career path where I'm able to play my French horn, and um, and I so I always kind of kept that as a as kind of an option for myself. And so for me, like finding something like Winsync was very much like solving the puzzle, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah, you were just, it's hard to, you know, the, the, the path of education is always, you know, here are the orchestral excerpts you have to learn. And, Mm -hmm. and it's just, that's the path, like there's no alternative. So that's, what's so exciting about the fact that you created what WinSync and, um, and I was looking at your Instagram a little while ago, and then you had added at it (laughs) some like, other orchestras, chamber orchestra that you played with and different things going on in Houston. And I'm like, you know, I think because Rice is there, there's so much going on Mm -hmm. in Houston. Yeah. Houston, Houston's been a really, really important um, piece of, of also of Winsync's success because of the, the culture of arts that it, that it has there. Rice being a huge factor. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So you guys are, currently in the throes of preparing for on stage off stage your upcoming chamber music festival so tell me all about this it seemed like a good idea at the time <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so scary i mean it's it's getting started in about two and a half days is that right ani oof something like that so we um we were very inspired by other um other chamber music festivals that are happening around the country that we have been fortunate to be a part of. Um, a great example is, example is the Chamber Music Fe- Festival of Lexington. And uh-huh. and we just kind of wondered why 
a festival like that that does such a good job at bringing the entire community of that that city together just for a week or two why that couldn't be replicated um, through us in Houston, which does have such an appreciate, appreciative um, audience and following for the arts. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think it, it just they really made it look so easy. And I don't think we realized yeah. all, of, all of the moving parts that that are just happening behind the scenes to make sure that um, this type of uh, this type of festival is a success. But it's been an interesting learning curve, that's for sure. Right. So, so did you, were you part of the Lexington festival in the past or? Yes, we're actually, uh, their ensemble in residence there and and we're going back on correct me if I'm wrong. Is this our fifth year going back? Yeah, Yeah, this will be our fifth summer. Uh, which is so exciting for us. We love everything that they're doing out there. Um, it's, it's just really exciting. So they have, they have just kind of instilled this interest in us in, in presenting music in totally different environments, literally popping up on a street corner and just sharing your music and watching everybody um, just become instantly interested in in what you're doing. Um, people that haven't even ever been exposed to classical music that are now starting to follow uh, follow it and what's going on. So we're, we're trying to replicate replicate what they're doing. That's so cool. So when you were preparing to present your own, did you, what kind of things did you do to, um, you know, skill up as far as like, you know, to, in, in order to replicate that, what did you, did you talk to them or did you, you know, what kind of things did you do before you dove in? Well, um, you know, sorry, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the, the cool thing is, is that, um, and, and what we what we kind of knew inherently about chamber music festivals is um, they become so unique to the place. So, yeah. so it wasn't a matter of um, it wasn't a matter of of us replicating their festival. It was a matter of us kind of, and we've been a part of their festival for four years now. So we've seen um, we've seen like a real kind of growth and evolution of their festival and we've been a part of all of their events and so we just Mm -hmm. kind of we just kind of thought about it and 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 even our other festivals that we've been a part of um we've done a lot of residency work um all over the country um and what we also realized was that we were doing a lot of the same work in houston already Mm -hmm. it was just a matter it was just a matter of kind of tying it all together and coordinating it at kind of the same time, which is where the which is where the beef comes into play, um, <laughs> because you're because you're coordinating. You know, the the beauty what we love about these chamber music festivals and these residency styles um, is the sheer diversity of the performances. So you know, we'll do we'll do a a really short casual concert at like the Rice Farmers Market, um, and that's how we're gonna kind of start off, and then we're gonna be doing school residencies and three elementary schools and um we'll do free concerts at um the at houston has this really amazing med center and they have a really beautiful um crane garden which is a lobby in one of the hospitals and so we'll do a really beautiful afternoon concert for um for patients and their families and anyone doctors nurses people circulating this really awesome um space and then we'll culminate with a main stage concert in Zilka Hall, which is where we're able to feature our guest artist, which is another Houston ensemble, um, Kinetic. And they're a really amazing conductorless chamber string ensemble. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, 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 we, what we're so inspired by is this crazy kind of diversity of events. Um, but that also becomes, you know, kind of the, uh, the challenge as well, getting everything all kind of lined up and, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that you market certain things and all this stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been like scary and really fun. And, um, we have our, all of our members have just gotten like, we've, we've just had such an amazing experience kind of bonding over this, even just like naming the festival. We, you know, it was like, it was like naming a little, it was like, it was like coming up with a name for our baby, you know, and like, so some were better than others. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, 
so it it was it's a really amazing it's been a really amazing time um and it's kind of cool because WinSync is uh WinSync is is in its eighth season right now and so we're not um we're not just kind of new and fresh out of the gate but this is kind of a way for us to um continue in our evolution and to kind of evolve into kind of something new and to allow all of us to kind of reincarnate and become re-inspired by things. So That's great. And it sounds like really probably the learning curve was just the concentrated amount of logistics that you're doing. Because it's like all, like you said, it's all the stuff that you've already been doing for all the seasons that you've been together, but now you're just doing it all in one week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's- Or two, is it two weeks or one week? It's, it's a week, yeah. yeah. One week. Okay. Um, and yeah, and the beautiful, the beautiful thing about it is that it is so unique to Houston. Like everything we're doing is so unique to Houston. And that's what's so cool. That's what yeah. we think is so cool about, about doing these chamber music residencies is that, um, it's a really like awesome time for us to explore cities and do, um, create art that is so unique to those people and those places. And, and that's really, really cool. I love how complete it is. It's, it's so holistic. You know, you're considering your environment and your city and everything. So it's really, really inspiring and beautiful. Um, I was I noticed that you do a lot of touring and you go to places like Alaska and <laughs> all over the place. So tell, tell me some more about your touring. Go ahead, Gear. Um. It's a lot of touring, <laughs> um, but it, it, it actually is like one of the beauties of this career path that we're on. I mean, we are so fortunate to get to see so much of the country and so much of the world. Of course, touring has its obstacles and its challenges in terms of, you know, maintaining your personal life and and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, but certainly, certainly worth it. I think a couple years ago we had we had tried to hit the tour circuit a little too hard, um, and over the past couple years we've really been refining um, our concept of how much we want to be on the road, how much we want to be home. Um, also, figuring out this idea um, of coming together and making sure we're getting appropriate rehearsal and preparation. Uh, into our seasons for touring. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but not all of Winsync members live in Houston. So oh, okay. uh, so we do need to figure out those logistics of co coming together um, before heading out on the road and, and stuff. So again, another challenge, but uh, uh, certainly worthwhile. Yeah, touring is one of those um, parts of Winsync that has actually always been a part of Winsync. Um, and I think it's been really important because there's so much learning that happens when you take what you're doing at home and you bring it, you know, anywhere else that's unfamiliar. And um, and so um, and so we Winsync has literally toured since its very first season and we've never had a season where the group hasn't toured. Um, and so uh, and then, but you know, then you get into when we first started and and we we really were just so hungry to tour. Um, touring was also very glamorous it was uh <laughs> we, we loved it you know the shades came out and the rock stars went on the road um that's when we were all single <laughs> <laughs> um but 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 what's been really interesting is over the course of eight years of travel um garrett and i have uh debriefed enough about this you know there it it does become we we had a season where we were on we had over 70 performances in seven months and that's um that's just that it's a lot um yeah. so so you know we had we've the pendulum swings and so um what we uh you know we've had to kind of you know we do a lot of like talking with other chamber ensembles and um and what what you learn is that full-time chamber ensembles kind of have a number at about you know, 150 to 180 days that they're on the road. And then that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. um, because, because as you, you know, it's just a matter of, is this sustainable or not? Um, and so, so yeah, so we were, we were really hungry and then we were, uh, and then we were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's, 
but touring is just like so important. Um, even even for myself, if I think about what when I started at, in kind of getting really interested in chamber music and its ability to be a vehicle for um, kind of social change and um, and reaching people. I was actually an undergrad and and the, and at the University of South uh, of uh, Southern California, which is where I went, they actually sent my horn quartet on a tour, and it was it was amazing. We went to New Orleans, and um, I came back from that experience and and just thought it was really one of the greatest like learning experiences I'd ever have. So like, so we when we talk to um, you know uh, college or university classes, this is definitely something that we encourage because of the. Um, because of the 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 skills in reading your audience and um and just becoming a more sensitive artist and musician that makes sense um so you mentioned talking to colleges, so you do a lot of things like you go you have your educational i saw that you have an educational component where you go into um classrooms and work with young wind players and then I think you mentioned, you know, at, at a college, you're talking to people about how to do kind of what you do, and then you tour, um, and you have to set up those tours. So um, how, first, I, it's a two-part question. I want to know all the different things that WinSync does, educational, on the educational side and the speaking side, as well as the performing side. And then the other part is how do you set up those tours? Do you, is it your job to reach out to each and every city and, and figure it out? Or do people call you and, and then you plan a tour around that? Uh, the answer to that question is, um, <laughs> is, is both, but it depends on at what point in our career you asked us. Um, okay. When we first began, well, it was, we were self-managed. Garrett, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just I was going to kind of say what I think you're about to say, which uh, which interestingly enough, when we go into um, universities and offer advice, entrepreneurial advice, career advice, um, in terms of pursuing uh, a path like like the one that we are on we're actually kind of giving them the tools that we used like five, six, seven years ago, not necessarily what we're doing now. Right. Um, we're, we're fortunate now to have our own booking agent that is largely responsible for, um, for finding and contracting our, our bookings and our tours. Um, right. But, but in terms of, of launching yourself into this career, it, it was very much wincing musicians reaching out to our network um, and creating our own opportunities that way. Um, and that's certainly what we're encouraging when we go into universities and um, and provide like feedback in terms of how to how to get started. That makes sense. Yeah. And and in order to do that, what 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 kind of happened to wincing was it started out as a chamber ensemble that was just very ambitious and wanted to play really ambitious repertoire, um, which is a really awesome way to start out because you get a group of just like absolutely fearless musicians in one room together. Um, but what happened was, was the group really was interested in pursuing performances outside of concert halls. And so what that forced um, this, you know, this like crazy group of musicians to do was to think about the various products or programs that could be offered in order to procure, you know, some kind of a fee or to in some way fill a need in society. And so and so one of those major ways was um, was reaching elementary school students. Uh, and so. So this also became a, like a, just a cornerstone of when sync was um, these really like interactive theatrical um, assembly programs. And we did so much like research and and just we were so interested in how do we get, you know, 350, 400 eight year olds in a room together and keep them entertained because we were, <laughs> yeah. just, we were just sure it was possible, but it didn't seem possible if we presented the music the way we'd been presenting it at Rice or at our various universities. Uh -huh. um, 
So, you know, so it was just a matter of just being, but we were, it was just, a, we were so interested in how do we do this because we were just so sure that it was possible. Classical music is, it's so <clears throat> theatrical and it's so engaging. And what it took was us memorizing the music, creating storylines. Mm. Um, what One of the things that became kind of the hallmark feature of these concerts, and it still is today, is a choreographed, very theatrical performance of Peter and the Wolf. Um, oh. and, so, and so what we realized is a wind quintet, a classical wind quintet can entertain, um, you know, <laughs> 350, you know, five to 11 year olds, um, ages five to 11. Uh, maybe not all in the same room together. To, you know, it helps if you break up the different ages into different groups. But, um, but we actually, it actually is possible. And what we learned from that is that, is that honestly, all audiences are very inspired by you know storylines and you know really engaging theatrical performances. And so, so the you know the the really cool part about this work that we did. Um, in the schools was that it 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 just like inspired our whole fiber and our whole being. And it's really, I think Garrett would probably agree with this because we we kind of reflect and talk sometimes about things. But I, I think it's why we won our first management contract. Mm. Because, For sure. Because we had this, we were very adept. We had this really kind of keen ability to um, present programming that was that was really a like inspired, very energetic. And and we never we never skirted any of the details. Like we were really really interested at all the time in you know how do we how do we make this an accessible experience for our audiences? It was always about our audiences to kind of an equal degree as it was about us and our own kind of aesthetic preferences and all this stuff. And yes, and that's a really amazing it's a really amazing place to be that like achieving that balance is um is just a really amazing place and we still argue all the time about it we had <laughs> we had so many arguments about you know what was stepping over this line and what was crossing this line and but that's good you know it was yeah it, because we had those struggles um anyway so uh so that's kind of what we talk about in and unfortunately universities are very much more interested in entrepreneurship then they, I feel like they're more interested than they, than when I was in school. Um, yeah, which is crazy. Like that wasn't that long ago, but the mentality has shifted so much in the past, like even just five years. Yeah. yeah. So that's, so that's really encouraging to us um, that this, that, that it, it appears that universities have shifted a little and, and that we feel like we can offer something in that regard. Um, right. The other really cool thing, and this is kind of just from our own experience within the chamber music world, but I also believe the chamber music world has shifted a bit um, from being a little bit more removed um, classical music presenters that that are kind of one note um, that present, you know, main stage concerts, very formal um, mm -hmm. I think they have shifted to really becoming these vehicles for community engagement as well. And um, some of them haven't, but a lot of them really have. They've kind of embraced uh, this idea that chamber music really can um, be this art form that, that, that bonds communities. And, um, and so as WinSync, I think, is, has become... Um, because of our adeptness at appealing to many different ages and backgrounds and all that stuff, we've um, we've also found a little bit of a niche there, um, mm. and it's yeah. it's and it's it's an incredibly inspiring and creative place to be in, um, and it, it's really just cool to kind of be on the edge of what's kind of always what's what's changing right now. Yeah, definitely. You are on the edge. And just the fact that you're talking about audience engagement and the um, the level that you hold of importance for the audience and interacting with the audience is so um, kind of new, I think, to classical music. I hate to say not new from like Mozart's era, but now, I mean, when you think about it, I really think classical musicians, I know when I was in school, um, we never talked about the audience. You just 
focused on our own stuff and, you know, hope the audience shows up and likes it, you know? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and that doesn't work in our noisy world anymore. There's too much other stuff to pay attention to. So you mm-hmm. can't hope that everyone's going to show up to everything. There's too much. So that's what's so exciting about what you're doing because you're bringing together a community. When you, when you get to know the people on the other side of that invisible wall between the stage and the audience, that's and make those connections. I think that's that's really where the future of classical starts, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and we learned early on kind of the rewards of, of those experiences. Um it's it's yeah. actually, it's amazing. We can go to just so many cities in this country and and particularly Lexington. Garrett and I think of that place very fondly because now this will be our fifth summer going back and we just have dear friends there they just you know we've we've spent five years getting to know them and them getting to know us and sharing um these really beautiful concerts with them and they're so appreciative and um and we feel when we go back that we are really a part of their community um and so it's just really really special Mm -hmm. that is special I love it. And, you know, you mentioned um, universities paying more attention to entrepreneurship and they're sort of being forced to, you know, I think. And also what you bring to the table when you go in and talk to those students is um, that you've been doing it already for close to 10 seasons, right? You said, are you in your... We're in our currently in our eighth Eighth, season, yes. So that's a long time to be doing something. And as much as you want to say that you can learn everything you need to know in school and then arrive in the real world and be ready for everything. I mean, you guys definitely know more than anyone that that's not true. So, um, you know, it's not true. And and we learned by making like plenty of mistakes along the way. Um, but, but found, found a lot of success from, from attempting things and some things worked and some things didn't, but, um, yeah, that needs to happen. That process is very important. Yeah. And that's so great because, you know, another thing that, you know, at least in my experience, and I'd say probably most classical musicians that you just, you feel like you have, you can prepare everything and make it perfect in the practice room, then go and win an audition or nail a performance or whatever, and not embrace your, your fails. And <laughs> Bonnie, do we have those? No, no fails, right? We're we're perfect. (laughs) That's, you know, that's one of those, um, it's really funny. Like we, we talk about this, like we really try and, and tell stories of, I mean, we, we, sometimes we have trouble remembering them, but we try to tell our stories of disaster because we want people to know that it's okay, you know? Um, but I do have to say the other skill about, that we have that that really has kept us alive in WinSync is knowing how to tell a good disaster story, but also, <laughs> but also knowing how to tell that story so that it then sounds like a story of success. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are so good at at like flipping the coin just on a dime, and and that's how you. But that's how you recover. Like that's resilience, you know. Resilience. Yeah. Just being able to say, okay, I screwed up. What can I learn from it? Moving on. Like Mm -hmm. that's really what needs to happen, you know? And, and the, the other cool thing for me, um, about working in this ensemble is, um, I've really, really had to, um, like learn that like people just see and experience the world in such different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. because it's so hilarious. I, I like, I'm, I'm constantly blown away at the various Um, ways in which all of us digest the same experience Um, and it's just it's like mind-boggling like Garrett and I will sometimes be in the same room with the same person we will walk out and we'll look at each other and I'll be like well that was great and Garrett will say that was awful (laughs) Um, so it's 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 like it's hilarious but it's um but you have to learn to you have to learn to really appreciate um, other perspectives and, um, and other ways of doing things. So, I mean, but this is just all kind of the beauty of chamber music. I mean, you could just, you could literally write like novels and books and whatever about just how amazing chamber music is because it, it really does lend itself to such, um, really awesome learning and, um, kind of people understanding and stuff. It's just great. That's so great. 
Um, so now that you've been at it a while, I'm going to ask you the money question because the question that now I'm now I'm comfortable enough because I've been asking people about money. At first, I didn't want to. And then I was like, I'm sure everyone, you know, I'm sitting there wondering how 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 do you make money? Well, is that a rude question? I don't know. So I'm just asking it now to all my guests. And it's a topic that most musicians tend to avoid, I'm finding. So what mm-hmm. um, what uh, how is that going for you? Like now that you've been at it a while, would you say that um, you're making a full time income that supports your lifestyle in WinSync? Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> chirp, 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 chirp. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, well, I don't have my yacht yet, so <laughs> so no, it's not supporting my lifestyle. Well, <laughs> we actually we actually um, do make what could be considered a full uh, a full time wage. Um, I I don't think it's like our ultimate uh, like goal that we want to reach in terms of musician compensation we are always uh looking towards our one year two year five year plan that's that continues to help increase musician salaries also our administrative salaries i mean we are literally doing like more than a full-time job um with everything that's uh, with all of the operations um of the group and being the musicians um so so musician compensation certainly um we look to continue to increase ani do you want to like i feel like i'm putting my foot in my mouth do you want to take over (laughs) we're really we're really working on getting a budget to get that yacht um (laughs) for for gear uh no so you know that's an it's 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 a good question um it's like we don't want to hide like anything about we don't have trouble talking about this. Um, it's just uh, it's 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 a tough question to answer because, you know, who knows, even with the five of us, half the time we don't even know how much money we like need or want to be making because um, that's it's it's weird when um, when you kind of dictate your own salary like it's a very bizarre place where you just kind of mm. like when you're building your budget you know, like there's kind of a range, you know, there's all these factors you look at in terms of revenue streams, but at the end of the day, like you write down like how much you're going to be making. And it's really bizarre. It, I mean, that's been a very bizarre experience for me. Um, and it, it does seem like the musicians who want to be like making more than they do go and seek opportunity to do that. So some, some of the musicians are doing a substantial amount of teaching on the side. Um, I know our oboist has a very healthy freelance career uh, in Washington, D.C., which she had prior to joining Winsync. So she's maintained um, both, actually. It, um, she's managed to maintain both of those. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we do have, like, our salary, and then people who uh, want or need additional income, um, they find find it yeah mm-hmm. and the yeah. other the other answer to that question is um at various points i mean we're talking about a touring career of seven at least seven years at this point so at various points um the numbers have been much higher like they, they've been they've been higher or lower depending on mm-hmm. the fluctuation of touring revenue um so so you know there was there was a season and this was the season i referred to where we had over 70 performances where every musician was being paid what I actually think could be considered a very competitive wage it's yeah. for full time. Uh-huh. I don't think, um, I don't, you know, Garrett wasn't able to purchase the yacht, but, he was, <laughs> but he wasn't, but he also wasn't living on ramen. So, um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it was, but so now we're, we're in, you know, we're in a, a, a place right now where, um, we are able to offer musicians, um, definitely a competitive rate and we are looking to um to build and grow at a steady because we we what we did was we experienced some kind of heavy fluctuations and so we're trying to um strengthen our nonprofit to kind of even those out and uh-huh. strengthen other revenue streams this is also something that we're getting into now which is winsync is a nonprofit, and so that's been a whole other 
um, beast in terms of learning about how these function and uh, yeah. how to keep them um, fiscally responsible and fiscally healthy. Um, but so that's kind of what we, what our five-year plan right now looks like is strengthening other revenue streams so that we don't have to be on tour, you know, 250 right. days out of the year, but so, but so we can offer um, more, we can offer stable and better rates of compensation for our musicians. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's just self-employed life really, you yeah. know, yeah. It's the challenges of it. And um, it's, I know there's a wide range of what people consider, you know, livable. And also you're allowed as a musician to want things and want, you know, better, you know, lifestyle. So it's not wrong. You know, <laughs> you can have a yacht someday, Garrett. I'm sure. Thank of you. Thank you. It's the wind sink <laughs> yacht. And you guys can travel around on the yacht and play concerts and have exclusive parties on it. I love Charge it. a buttload of money for it. I, I, love I, it. Would, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on, on my show, I always ask each guest about their defining career moment where they were at a crossroads and they chose the more difficult path after they were already on a path that seemed, you know, maybe more known, the screw this moment. And so I wanted to know um, what yours, what each of yours was. Gosh, um, I'm, I don't know that I have an answer to that. Uh, I, I do know, um, I mean, maybe this is like TMI. I do know there was a period <laughs> when I, when I first moved down to Houston um, to start my master's degree, uh, I had some like bizarre, random freak health issues um, with my lung. And it, it actually caused me to not be able to play my flute for basically um, an entire year almost. Oh, wow. um, and so like, I guess like related to your question, that was certainly an opportunity for me to like, stick the flute under the bed, let it collect dust and decide if I was going to like weather this out or if I was going to fly back home to Canada and get started on something else. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I guess that was my screw this moment. And I, <laughs> whether it was the right decision or not, <laughs> stayed in Houston. Yeah. And so, and you got better and, and it must've been, that was definitely an unknown because you were probably worried. What if, you know, what if my lung doesn't, you know, come back? Soon? Yeah. Well, well, um, we were pretty confident that like all that would sort itself out. Um, but there was this just really bizarre period where, um, where I have come to one of the most competitive, um, training programs in the country. Um, and then I'm not able to play with my fellow studio members. And then I literally, after a year, have to pick this instrument up and kind of start from scratch. And that's not that's not necessarily a great confidence or ego booster. So there was there was just a lot of um, personal uh, like growth and personal um, self reflection that needed to happen in that time to make sure that. I, I could get strong kind of emotionally more so than like strengthening my flute playing again, but like, just like mind and body was, uh, I was figuring that stuff out at the same time. It was, um, it was like a really important moment in my life, I think. Mm. Okay. I think I, I, so I've, I've heard this story from Garrett before, um, because it's actually funny. It, uh, it also coincides with um, kind of the founding of Winsync because um, oh, yeah. it, it was during it was during this time when he actually met um, our founding bassoonist member. Um, so and it was actually because she was picking him up from the hospital, which is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like a very random, bizarre event that uh, that has a lot to do with even like Winsync's founding with its initial cast. Um, mm -hmm. But I think uh, when I hear Garrett tell that story, it's it's really interesting to me because it just kind of seems like one of those moments where you where you almost get a little bit of like a an ego pride check about what you're doing. And you kind of realize 
that what you're doing has a lot of meaning for you become a little bit more grateful for mm -hmm. for your ability to experience this and to share it with other people and yeah. and i think it made him um more open and appreciative to kind of the things that winsink does and and still does um and and that's kind of what if if you don't if you don't kind of think about those things then then you you might take winsink for granted you know you, you might take any musical experience for granted you might take an orchestra job for granted who knows you yeah. know um for okay so my crazy story is um <laughs> also has to do with why i'm in winsink um oh, yeah. I, I i was doing a master's degree in cincinnati and i was um and i ended up in a summer program in italy of all places and um and i was really thinking about my trajectory as a musician i was i i i just really wasn't sure what i was doing and was trying to come up with an alternative career path and uh also, um, the founding member and bassoonist uh, was at this festival and um, we would get up and kind of talk and she would tell me about Winsync, which Winsync had only been around for, you know, a couple of semesters at Rice and she had just graduated college and she was looking to um, create a career out of this ensemble. And so she told me all about it and I thought to myself, wow, that sounds really awesome. Like, I actually think I could lend a lot of skills to something like this, but that's kind of where my mind ended. Um, and then at the end of the summer, she, she, she says to me, like, she's like, oh my gosh, like the horn player that I thought was going to play in this group just told me she can't. And then she said, do you want to move to Houston and play in this group? And we looked at each other and I said, well, that would be impulsive. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then the rest is history so i i six days like we we flew back we flew back um and six days later i was in houston having coffee with garrett at our first rehearsal and uh i don't think i don't even think garrett was fully briefed on the story about how i was there um wow. so so i think he was a little bit like wait where did you come from <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter. You were at least there. Yeah. Um, so, so that was kind of my, it, it's kind of my like craziest story because I, I dropped out of grad school to do something like this. Um, uh -huh. But I, for me, like I said, I'd always kind of been in this mindset where I was, I was kind of looking for an alternative. And so, yeah. and so to me, this was kind of the perfect way of experiencing that and determining its viability. That's great. And that's definitely um, an, uh, like an example of y it would have been a lot safer for you just to say, oh, you know, I already, um, you know, signed up for grad school. And so, you know, I'm going to stay here, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It yeah. takes a big it's a risk to drop out of school and move to another state. So, yeah. Awesome. So um, so what are what's next for Winsync? Vacation. <laughs> I think you deserve it from what it I, sounds like. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. You, you definitely need to spend some time in the sun lounging on, on your yacht gear. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think we all need to crowdfund this yacht because... <laughs> See? Now we're thinking. It's really good, you know? <laughs> I love how we've, we've created quite a theme for this conversation for her as well. There's I, I ain't mad at it. There's really, there's really a through line. I love it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, no, we have so many things coming up. We have our Chamber Music Festival coming up. Um, we have the first installment of um, our Sound Places residency, which is um, a partnership with Chamber Music America, um, the Louisiana um, Council for the Arts, Project for Public Spaces in New York, and um and funding from national endowment for the arts and this is going to be a really amazing um residency which is built for a cultural district in louisiana so it's 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 like what we're talking about where we as the chamber ensemble um collaborate with community partners and city developers and all of these things to create a residency that really enriches and uh and kind of re-inspires um, this community, and so we're putting on our placemaking hats, as they say, and we're um, and we're gonna we're gonna do a residency out there in early May. So that's really cool. cool. And we'll also be going back a few other times throughout the course of 2017 
Um, and Sound Places is a pilot program, but we're really, really excited to be, you know, one of these um, founding kind of ensembles of the pilot program that Chamber Music America developed. Um, so that's really cool. We also have, we're already making plans for our 10 year, um, or our 10th season anniversary, um, which is coming up in October of uh, 2018. Right, right, right. Yes. Um, so, uh, so that's going to be really exciting. We also have some really awesome programming coming up with that, or coming up that we're going to be, um, that we've already started and we will be continuing to develop over the summer. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually really exciting. We're, we're focusing on the cosmos and space, um, cool. and drawing upon Houston as the space city and our proximity to NASA and, um, and a concerto that we commissioned for wind quintet and orchestra that is also called the cosmos. Um, and so we're kind of, we're drawing upon all of these themes that seem to kind of be um, already orbiting wind sync, if you will. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we're really, we're, we're creating a program that, um, that we're really excited about. And so we're going to, we're going to have uh, all kinds of new arrangements and a new commission um, and so it's, it's going to be really cool and it's going to be exploring kind of, uh, all these really awesome aspects of the cosmos and planets and space and our role on earth and all of that. That's so deep. Deep. That, <laughs> that is, is deep. That's wincing. Really <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. And look, I'm going to have to get all these links to all these festivals and mm -hmm. residencies and stuff so I can put them in the show notes. So when people are listening, they can check them out. You know, um, if they're in the area, they can come and see you. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So I'll get those all from you and, and I'll put them in there. So I have two more questions for you. Um, what is the most, uh, sorry, what is the one habit or behavior you've developed in your career or your life that has made the most difference in your life or career so far? Oh man, you saved the tough ones for the end. Uh... <laughs> well, I can jump in, Gare. Um, mm -hmm. Can you but... answer for both of us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I, I think... This is like kind of a boring answer, I think, but like when you're self, like I think a lot of people have aspirations to be self-employed and like they should because there's a lot of really great benefits. Um, but it takes a lot of um, discipline <laughs> yeah. um, because when you have the structure of being in school, it's really easy. It keeps you running around and busy and playing all the time. And, you know, you only have a few hours to get, you know, this task done. And so you do it um, when you just have a wealth of time at your disposal. Um, you have to be really, really judicious about how you spend it. If you are going to keep yourself in a place that is like productive and healthy and works for that career. So, right. um, so uh, we all, tr I think what we all have learned the most is kind of like, okay, you know, I need this amount of time to practice and this is my practicing time and that time is sacred, you know, yes. and I need and I need this amount of time to like do admin work and I need to make sure that I don't let that administrative work ever kind of, um, you know, take over any of my practicing time or just making sure that everything stays kind of balanced. Yeah. Um, I think the other skill and this is like this is also like kind of dumb and boring but to-do lists are awesome <laughs> <laughs> um and you know just like having having that that you know that thing it, I think for a lot of people it feels really good to cross something off the list yeah um it provides it's just kind of a way of you providing that kind of oversight of yourself that that uh you know a boss or a manager would do um in another kind of job but you do it for yourself and that's great and um actually i have this really funny joke with um with my boyfriend like we joke about like the man like the my boss and he's like and he'll be like wow your boss is being really mean today like why haven't you had like he didn't even give you like like your boss didn't give you a lunch break today you know and it's like oh wait i'm the boss right. um so so you know there's it's just like how you 
you have to learn to treat yourself like, you know, like the employee and how do you, you know, how do you deal with yourself and your habits, yeah. you know? Organization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I also, I mean, this isn't necessarily like a quantifiable thing, but I, I actually think that our ability with like interpersonal skills and like teamwork is just on a, a different level than, you know, people who are kind of sitting in cubicles all day long and not to like diminish that side of, of work or whatever. But, um, Ani like often says, like we are literally in like a five way relationship and <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's true. Like we are, we are basically married to each other. So, um, the tools and strategies that we have developed that aren't written on paper, you can't necessarily do that to be able to work well with each other and to be right. able to respect each other and learn and grow with each other. I, I I think that that is probably something that certainly has translated to each of us. Yeah. 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 Like, I think you're, you're right saying it's like a different level. Um, Mm -hmm. There was was a moment, there was a moment I remember back when we were touring, like just crazy. And, um, we, I remember we all woke up, we had, we like, we just so seamlessly came up with what time we needed to get ready to leave the house, like leave the hotel, like so that we, so that, so that we could, (laughs) so so that we could get to the airport with like enough time to be reasonably like, you know, like make sure we were responsible about making it. And I just remember, like, all of us were ready, like, so seamlessly, just, and I was just thinking, like, and then we, like, just hopped into the van, we got to the airport, it was just, and I was just thinking, like, man, like, if I was doing this with four friends, like, you better believe it would be more chaotic, and, like, and, you know, like, the negotiation of, like, you know, what time do we need to be ready, and, like, nobody would be, probably be ready, and, like, but we all just kind of know... Um, how to maintain ourselves in a way that that like that really benefits the group, and that takes a lot of practice because you have to yes. learn you have to learn so much about yourself and your impact on the group. Yeah, and considering other people, like you know, I was just having this conversation with a friend the other day about how um, certain people don't take. You know, for me, I like to be at the airport super early because I don't want to stress about getting through security. You know, you and um, you and I would get along really well. <laughs> <laughs> but there are certain people in my family, in particular, um, who just they're like really relaxed about getting to the airport, and then they they're always running late, and then there's always a long line, and there's always traffic, and they barely make it. It's something like they I don't know if they get a rush off of it or something. I don't know, but. I'm not, I wouldn't want that. You know, I like to be really early because flying is stressful enough. Mm -hmm. Getting through with your, I mean, I don't know if you guys try to smuggle through reed knives or anything like that, but I mean, you guys wouldn't, but your people in your group. Right. They check them. It's okay. Oh, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) I got to smuggle my reed knife. But yeah, you know, and then the the other element of that is just our sheer like communication skills. Like I, I think for the most part, like we all try to develop an environment where, I mean, I think I probably am like, I think within Winsync, I am possibly the most comfortable sharing what I feel and what I think. Like then, you know, even in comparison with like probably some of my closest relationships, just because, mm. because we have built a, you know, a relationship that is so like respectful and so trustful. It's, it has so much trust, you know, and so... So we all, and we really try to maintain that. Like we, we try to make sure that people feel really comfortable with sharing and being really honest and, and, and talking about what they think and feel. That's so awesome. I want to join your family. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, that's so important. I'm sure because you spend so much time together. Traveling with someone is very challenging usually, you know, just because of the stress of of travel. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to talk it out and figure out a schedule and a plan that works for everybody, that's, that's, you know, that's logistics. That's really important. So awesome, you guys. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been a great conversation and I really appreciate it. And the best of luck to you on your, um, on your chamber festival. Oh yeah. You make sure Kara tells you about all the disasters. (laughs) 
What? Make sure Kara tells you about all the disasters in the in the upcoming episode. Yes, <laughs> when I have Kara on, she can tell me how it went and everything that happened. So that's gonna, it's going to be such a cool before and after. Don't, I can try to. Don't I'll, let her. Don't let her tell you it all went well. Yeah, I know. I want her to tell me all the truths. So that'll be great. Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much. And if for the listeners out there, if you're enjoying Crushing Classical, please write a review on iTunes and join me on the conversation on facebook.com slash crushing classical and at Instagram on crushing classical. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.